Uh, good morning, everyone. We might get uh, proceedings underway. On behalf of Greens List, I welcome you to the uh, session this morning. This is an update on serious injury applications and the issues that practitioners on both the plaintiff and the defendant side face in terms of dealing with this ever-growing and ever more complex area. This is an update on a talk that was done by Stephen Jurica and Ethan Mikowski of this list about 12 months ago and the purpose of this talk is to really update things and as always with this area of serious injury things are always moving and uh, with uh, any luck uh, you should work, walk away with both an update as to what the issues are in the, in the cases, the most recent cases and also some useful ideas as to how to run and prepare these cases. They can be sudden death for either side if they're not properly managed. And uh, uh, with any luck, uh, you'll uh, walk away with a couple of gems to uh, help you with the next file that you have. Now, by way of background, uh, we have as presenters, uh, Stephen Jurica to my immediate left. Stephen was admitted to practice in 2004. He signed the role in 2009. He's uh, uh, as a solicitor, he worked at DLL Piper and he worked in a, a wide range of areas including finance and commercial matters uh, and also um, uh, moved on to Maddox where he worked in the property and construction group. Now he comes to the bar with that sort of broad background. Uh, some of you might know him from his former life as an AFL football player. He doesn't want anything more said about that. Um, he uh, practices at the bar uh, and has been practising for the last five years, doing a fairly even mix of uh, plaintiff and defendant work. So on that basis, I'd commend what Stephen has to say to you as being reasonably balanced. Now, I'd make the same comments in relation to Paul, who's seated to my far left. Now, Paul uh, did articles at Anderson Rice. He uh, was admitted to practice in March of 1996. He signed the role last year, in May of 2013. And he uh, is, uh, comes to the bar having been uh, an associate to his honour judge rendered. And the, he was a, an associate to his honour judge rendered in the county court in the mid-90s. Those of us who practice in the workers' compensation area might remember judge rendered as being a prodigious and uh, uh, learned judge in the area who, who uh, uh, Paul no doubt learned a lot from. Subsequent to that, uh, he also... Uh, worked as a senior associate in Minter Ellison's uh, Insurance and Corporate Risk Group and more recently he worked for the Transport Accident Commission and he was there as senior legal manager at the Transport Accident Commission managing uh, common law claims and the defence of them. So each of the presenters is well qualified to, to present to you and, and both of them, both Paul and Stephen, uh, uh, have a mixed plaintiff and defendant uh, practice at the bar, so again bring that balance to the presentation. In terms of the layout or the, the order of play, we'll start with Stephen. He'll be uh, covering some of the cases. He'll have one block uh, uh, covering the cases. Then we'll have Paul doing another block of cases. We'll have a break and then we'll have a session where each of them will put forward some practical tips in terms of how to prepare and run these cases, and then we'll have some question time at the end. So without anything further, I now uh, ask you to welcome Stephen. Thanks, Bruce, and good morning, everyone. Uh, the first case I'd like to talk about is the range case of Phelan and the TAC, which was a case of a Court of Appeal of last year of November. This was a case that could have gone either way at first instance and it was about a refusal of leave to bring common law proceedings and this was an application uh, for leave to appeal against the, the primary judge's ultimate finding that whilst the applicant had significant and marked disability it didn't meet the very considerable threshold for serious injury. And the question here was uh, whether the judge failed to consider the consequences of the injury for the applicant in evaluating if the injury was serious or not. Essentially, the appeal was dismissed and uh, Appeal Justice Ashley 
went through and talked about the conventional test that needed to be applied. And that question is, is the decision uh, attended with sufficient doubt to warrant grant of leave and would substantial injustice be caused if the decision was allowed to stand? He went through a number of matters, six in fact to be borne in mind, and I've provided that in the paper, and I'll just go through them with you uh, quickly. The first is that the applicant uh, bore the burden of persuasion, and she failed to discharge that burden in this case. Secondly, the ap application required findings of fact to be made, and in considering whether it had been demonstrated that a finding was erroneous, the ordinary appellate process is engaged. And then uh, the court looks at credit findings. Thirdly, once the facts were found, the primary judge was required to judge whether the applicant had established that her injury was serious and met the statutory definition. And that's an ultimate finding which must be dis displaced if the applicant is to su succeed in this court. Fourthly, uh, the ultimate finding was one which involved elements of fact, degree and value judgment. And I emphasise this. Decision uh, that the injury was or were not serious injury will only be set aside when there's specific error or where it's plainly wrong or whether it's wholly erroneous. Fifthly, the specific error, error may lie in erroneous findings of fact or in a wrong expression of legal principle. And lastly, uh, not every fact-finding error or misstatement or misapplication of legal principle will result in grant of leave to appeal and that success of the appeal. And then His Honour went through that uh, analysis. And I'll just also point out at paragraph 58, Appeal Justice Ashley went on to, to make uh, some further comments. He said, I do not say that another judge taking different account of elements of fact, degree and value judgment might not have reached a contrary conclusion. And had that happened, an appeal by the TAC could have been expected to fail. But that's not the point. In essence, uh, he said that the applicant had not shown that the ultimate decision was plainly wrong or wholly erroneous or patently untenable. So it's a, it's a high bar and threshold to get over. But uh, essentially we still have range cases that do come before the courts. The next case is the case of uh, Focus uh, and Staff Australia Proprietary Limited, which just got handed down around the time that Atan Mikowski and I delivered our last presentation. And this case was a case of disentanglement. And here uh, there was an application for leave uh, to bring common law proceedings for pain and suffering. And it was alleged to be both physical and psychological. And the question here was whether the appellant proved substantial organic basis for pain and suffering. And whether there was a need to disentangle physical contributions from psychological contributions uh, for the purposes of the Act. Appeal Justice Nettle spoke about how uh, in these types of cases it's quite difficult uh, where the applicant for leave to bring proceedings relies on pain and suffering consequences which are alleged to be both physical and psychological. And he mentioned that uh, the difficulty existed uh, because of the distinction of that subparagraph of 38H of the Act. Uh, and that, that distinction needs, to, it demands to be drawn between those consequences of a serious injury where it's psychological, psychiatric, and those that are not. Appeal Justice Nettle went on to say that the primary judge should have uh, looked at the approach in that two step manner. And that's been described by President, Max, President Maxwell in Meadows and uh, Lichmore uh, of the case of last year. The first step was to ask whether there is substantial organic basis for the pain and suffering consequences relied upon. If the answer is yes, then 
uh, we go into the usual step of whether the, the pain and suffering consequences satisfy the statutory test. Then the applicant will succeed and then there won't be any need for disentangling. If the answer is no, or can't be answered with a yes, then the applicant will need to take the next step and disentangle. And when we say disentangle, we're saying separ separ separating out the physical uh, from the psychological components. In order to be able to satisfy the court uh, that the pain and suffering consequences attributable to the physical injury satisfy that test. Uh, the primary judge was held to be in error in failing to ask first whether there was that substantial organic uh, basis for the pain and suffering consequences on which the appellant relied upon and then failing to find on the balance of probabilities that there was. The court accepted uh, that there was an organic impairment with significant consequences and it was not persuaded that in this case the appellant was obliged to disentangle any consequences of a psychiatrically responsive pain and in this instance the appeal was allowed. And proceedings, uh, he, the court granted the appellant leave to bring proceedings for the recovery of damages for pain and suffering only. <coughs> Another uh, and, and later disentanglement case is that of peak engineering and, and dare I say the matter of Bruce McKenzie as well. It's got the McKenzie surname there. And in this case, uh, it concerned whether uh, it really was an appeal from a grant of uh, leave to bring uh, common law proceedings. It involved a hand injury and the question was whether it was necessary to separate consequences attributable to the hand injury from consequences to a separate knee injury. And the appeal was allowed. So we had this left hand injury in February 2004, which was with the original injury, and we had a later left knee injury in the course of work in 2008. At trial, both counsels submitted that uh, the trial judge needed to disentangle the consequences of the two injuries. So his honour would need to decide whether the consequences attributable to the 2004 hand injury satisfied the test. Uh, there was evidence disclosed uh, about the restrictions on Mr McKenzie's activities were attributable to both injuries. So for example, he gave evidence that both the knee injury and the hand injury caused pain during at night, which affected his sleep. Uh, and the employer and the authority appealed uh, from that judgment on the grounds that his honour was bound to identify and exclude the continuing consequences for Mr McKenzie of the knee injury, and also when the consequences properly referable to the 2004 hand injury were identified, they could not be reasonably viewed as satisfying the statutory test and the appeal was allowed. Uh, at paragraph 24, uh, the court held that in a case of this kind, where there are two separate injuries that are concurrently producing pain and suffering consequences for the applicant, it will ordinarily be necessary to make findings about all of the pain and suffering consequences which are operative at the date of the trial. And this was uh, an essential precondition to the task of finding out uh, where the pain and suffering consequences are attributable to which uh, injury. There was also uh, evidence indicating that certain of the pain and suffering consequences which the primary judge uh, regarded as relevant were attributable to the knee injury as well as to the hand injury. So the evidence enabled the consequences of both the hand injury uh, need to be identified and evaluated. Uh, and the evidence as to Mr McKenzie's experience of pain was consistent with the evidence as to its effect on his life, both in relation to his work and in relation to ordinary daily activities. And the consequences were moderate by comparison 
with the consequences of other cases of possible impairments. impairments. They might perhaps have been described as significant or marked, but they weren't more than that. And therefore, the court held that the pain and suffering consequences of the 2004 injury could not be viewed as at least very considerable, or certainly more than significantly marked. Uh, moving on to the next case of Alice Management, Services Limited and Taylor. That's uh, an aggregation case uh, of November of 2013, another Court of Appeal decision. Uh, that was uh, a serious injury application for leave to commence proceeding uh, for pain and suffering only. The application was granted in first instance and the question was whether the judge below impermissibly, impermissibly relied upon the loss of earning capacity consequences in allowing the application and ultimately the appeal was dismissed. The primary judge, His Honour Judge Parrish, was looking at a right elbow arm injury and His Honour considered that it was a matter of great importance that uh, the plaintiff, who was substantially illiterate, 44 years of age, uh, who relied on his physical dexterity to perform a variety of jobs, was now limited to work. Uh, and he was right-hand dominant as well. Uh, and, and his work was substantially reduced. He accepted that the plaintiff could perform some present uh, duties and perhaps could even increase them to full time, but it was clear in his honour's view that this ongoing right elbow uh, condition would prevent him from doing many of the tasks and jobs that uh, he used to do before the injury. The appellant submitted that uh, in an application for leave to commence a proceeding for pain and suffering damages, it, wasn't allow it shouldn't be allowed, essentially, to aggregate pain and suffering consequences and loss of earning, uh, consequences, loss of earning capacity consequences as well. And the court made note that there was force in the appellant's uh, submissions. But the court held and stated the following at paragraph 35. While pecuniary disadvantage consequences may not fall for consideration in a pain and suffering damages only case, as was acknowledged by the appellant, that does not mean that in all cases a worker's inability to engage in employment of a particular kind has no relevance in application for leave for pain and suffering damages. Uh, as it had been repeatedly held in the past, the inability of a worker to engage in employment uh, which they enjoyed is a matter which may be taken into account in assessing pain and suffering and loss of enjoyment of life. Also to be taken into account is the frustration of not being able to engage in former activities, whether it be work or leisure. And these are all proper considerations to be taken into account. Lastly, the court held that uh, His Honour did not impermissibly aggregate pain and suffering consequences with loss of earning uh, capacity consequences and the appeal uh, was dismissed. The, the final case uh, I'd like to talk about is uh, the case that everyone's been waiting in the wings for and it finally was delivered and that was the case of uh, Wingfoot Australia Partners and Kochak, and that was delivered uh, on the 30th of October 2013 by the High Court. And it's important to go through this case uh, because a lot of uh, matters were being put on hold waiting for this decision to see whether or not to go to the panel and whether or not that decision was binding. Essentially, uh, the case concerned legal consequences of the med medical panel, panel's opinion under the Act. And here there are separate proceedings for both common law damages and the statutory compensation. And the question here was whether the medical panel's opinion on medical questions referred to it in one proceeding was required to be adopted and applied in another. And I'll just point out to you section 68, subsection 4, 
of the Act says the following. The opinion of a medical panel on a medical question referred to the medical panel is to be adopted and applied by any court, body or person and must be accepted as final or conclusive by any court, body or person irrespective of who referred the medical question to the panel or when the question was referred. This involved, by way of some background, an injury in May 2009 uh, for a neck injury and a claim for statutory compensation was made. The stat compensation application was transferred from the county court to the magistrate's court and uh, the medical panel uh, gave its uh, reasons for the opinion at the magistrate's court and the employer foreshadowed a contention and uh, in the county court uh, stated that the county court was bound by the opinion of the medical panel either by virtue of section 68.4 of the Act or on the basis that the orders made uh, by consent in the magistrate's court gave rise to an issue, in an issue of estoppel. The Court of Appeal, sorry, then it went off to the uh, Supreme Court uh, and then again appealed uh, by the, uh, to the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal held and allowed an appeal by the worker and made the order sought. The Court of Appeal concluded that the reasons given by the medical panel for the opinion were inadequate. Now, I just want to touch on this. The section of the Act talks about any court, body or person. Uh, the, court, the High Court of Australia said those words should not be given a literal meaning. More particularly, six, Section 68, Subsection 4 does not speak at all to an action for damages brought by a worker against an employer. And the relevant paragraphs in this decision are 37, uh, 38 and 39. <coughs> and at 37, the High Court held Section 68, subsection 4 of the Act, on that construction requires uh, that an opinion of a medical panel on a medical question referred to it must thereafter be adopted and applied for the purposes of determining the question or matter. And I emphasise the question. Arising under or for the purposes of the Act in which the medical question arose and in respect of which the medical question was referred to the medical panel. That section does not require uh, that the opinion must thereafter be adopted and applied for the purposes of determining some other question or matter. And I emphasise those last words. The Act didn't have and doesn't have the further effect of requiring the opinion given on the medical questions referred in this statutory compensation application to be adopted and applied and to the extent the same medical question may arise into the determination of the question or matter subject of the serious injury application. <coughs> the court went on to talk about estoppel. The magistrate's court's, uh, court's adoption and application of the opinion when dismissing the statutory compensation application therefore created no issue of estoppel binding the parties in the conduct of the serious injury application. And thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Stephen. Bruce. Good morning, everyone. We have uh, quite a diverse range of cases for you today, and uh, as we start the second half, and I just reflect on it, it actually it might seem a joke to people outside the jurisdiction, but it is quite a vibrant area of law in terms of uh, the diversity of these cases and the twists and turns that these cases obviously go through, uh, not only in the running, but in some cases between conduct of the OM hearing and, and the appeal. And to some extent, it's, um, we can't know whether that reflects, in some cases, lack of preparation, the development of the medical evidence, but also uh, we must be conscious of the fact that the preparation for these cases, in many cases, started before such decisions as Meadows and Lichmore and, uh, and Filipowicz were handed down. And so the emphasis uh, over the last couple of years has been very strongly on disentangling and, uh, and practitioners on both sides are still, are still trying to grapple with that. But my first case is uh, what seems like a classic credit case, a surveillance case of Kalanick, where uh, the plaintiff, had, uh, a worker, had a metal plate fall on his leg. 
Uh, he received a couple of uh, infusions, uh, wore a compression stocking, took quite heavy medication. Uh, he had ongoing pain and swelling, uh, complex regional pain syndrome type 1. And the main uh, cause of his restrictions was his, his ongoing pain. Uh, and the critical issue at the, at the hearing was his capacity to walk and stand for long periods of time. And there was um, what, uh, and, and Chief Justice Warren um, described it at, at, at first blush, at first blush, uh, the surveillance in this case you'd think would be sufficient to, to knock out uh, a plaintiff of this, uh, of this nature making those sorts of claims. Uh, and also you'd think, well, it's a fairly courageous decision to appeal such a, such a finding in relation to, to credit. Um, the, uh, the trial judge uh, noted um, significantly uh, in relation to quite lengthy surveillance that the plaintiff was observed to walk in a normal manner and was not seen to experience any pain or restriction when walking these distances, nor was any problem seen when walking from the station after standing in one spot on the train, a problem he has told doctors would limit his ability to work. But this is where the importance of uh, his, uh, the histories that he'd given to doctors, his affidavit material and um, the, the GP notes um, that had been uh, created by his, his own general practitioner uh, following his consultations, they, they came in um, as uh, really containing evidence that he did, he did walk regularly. He was told to walk regularly. He had a cardiac condition. Uh, he, he did give varying histories in relation to the, the length of time for which he walked, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, up to an hour. Uh, <coughs> he said um, he did walk more slowly and he was, he was restricted. Um, and uh, also, um, uh, Justice of Appeal Osborn uh, gave the, um, the principal judgment, but both he and Chief Justice Warren uh, agreed that it was also critical that um, he did give evidence through an interpreter, and uh, he was, to a certain extent, not asked about um, other restrictions. So, uh, and there was no reliance, no critical reliance by medical examiners on the, the, those histories, that, um, the incorrect histories that he'd given. And so the alleged total inconsistency um, was not really not sufficient, um, it was not squarely put to him in cross-examination and should not have formed the basis for um, a, such a total credit finding against him. And one thing that's... Um, to me, it illustrates sort of a, a real-life type um, scenario where um, the plaintiff does give varying histories from time to time, and certain examiners are able to elicit further details, such as Mr Anstey, he got the additional detail that um, the plaintiff took his daughter to and from school and, and also walked his son's dog. And so he actually walked more than, more than once a day and, and several times a day. Uh, and that's to be contrasted with his affidavit, and I'm a bit surprised that his affidavit wasn't um, commented on by the the Court of Appeal, but it was one of those ones that we see, or used to see, um, where a plaintiff, and this is through an interpreter, mind you, continued to experience very significant problems with the performance of intrinsic and functional physical activity, uh, whatever that, that means. But notwithstanding that, uh, his, um, basically the fact that he was candid with most medical examiners um, led to him being successful on appeal. The next case is uh, TAC and Florimel. It's fair to say the plaintiff in this case had um, some issues pre-accident. Uh, and I just want to run through um, the, the nature and extent of his uh, pre-existing um, injuries. I, it's hard, a bit hard to work out his age. I think he's about 40 at the time of the, the hearing. It says... Um, before the injury occurred, the plaintiff suffered from significant problems of his lumbar spine and had undergone a double level fusion at L45, L5S1, also had pre-existing problems at L34. He'd made complaints about symptoms affecting his left hip and leg pain from time to time, which appeared to result from nerve root irritation. He'd had a left shoulder operation and ongoing problems with his left shoulder. He was on disability pension because of his inability to work and was significantly, already significantly restricted. He'd also suffered from a compression fracture, this is all unrelated, at T11, which led to the need for an MRI, and um, he had sleeping difficulties and emotional problems. 
and pre-existing headaches. He um, brought his uh, OM hearing on the basis of injuries to his cervical spine and right shoulder. Uh, the trial judge knocked out the um, cervical spine. It wasn't, um, wasn't sufficient to meet the test. But then it turned out that he also had a pre-existing right shoulder injury, which he hadn't told some of the, the medicos about. And it was also common ground that he hadn't complained about his shoulder in relation to the transport accident until six weeks after the accident. Notwithstanding that, the, the trial judge preferred the opinions of two of the orthopaedic surgeons who'd received incorrect medical histories from him over that of the defendant's orthopaedic surgeon, uh, Mr Kearse, who uh, at the stage that, that he provided his report had the benefit of the complete radiology and operation reports in relation to the, to the previous procedures. Uh, and also, um, in his report, made a clear statement that the, um, that the plaintiff was obviously an unreliable historian. And uh, in overturning the uh, trial judge's finding as to, to causation, uh, the Court of Appeal made quite strong comments that a finding as to causation, unlike a finding as to the serious injury threshold, is not an evaluative, evaluative judgment and there has to be a clear path of reasoning demonstrated for preferring one medical opinion over the other. And that is even, that's a more stringent requirement still, where um, it's clear that the, the medical report that is being preferred does rely on incorrect medical histories. The, Next case is that of Win Wingfoot. It's called Wingfoot Australia Partner in the Proprietary Limited in the uh, report. I assume it's the same as, as COCAC and its partners. But um, uh, it's a, uh, a case where a, um, a worker had pain in his right shoulder from about 1995 to 2001 when it it started to become a, a bigger problem um, and he ceased work in 2002. He was referred for psychiatric treatment in, uh, not until 2006, four years after he ceased work. And um, it was um, on the evidence a relatively mild physical injury to he, that he'd suffered to his um, right shoulder being a, a mild uh, supraspinatus tendonitis and or subacromial bursitis. And the trial judge was not satisfied that that injury satisfied the, um, the test for pain and suffering consequences. Um, it had been an aggravation injury and, and not been permanent, more importantly. However, the, um, the pain caused by that aggravation uh, was found to be sufficient to trigger an agitated depressive reaction uh, which was ongoing, a psychiatric injury, and which in turn was accepted as being severe, notwithstanding that that psychiatric treatment didn't commence until 2006, um, some five years after the <coughs> aggravation and four years after he, he ceased work. So the, um, on appeal, the appellant didn't actually contest the finding of severe, but um, said that there were, asserted that there was a logical inconsistency in the, the trial judge's findings that the, um, although the physical con consequence of the aggravation was not um, permanent, that, that, and that, that itself was inconsistent with the finding as to causation for the, the psychiatric inju injury. The two couldn't, couldn't match up. And, uh, and the Court of Appeal um, considered that there was no inconsistency in this case. It was it was open on the, on the medical evidence uh, from the, the reports and that logic didn't demand such a temporal coincidence between, between the two events. And there was in fact no, no medical evidence to the contrary um, that the causal link um, had to be dependent on, on ongoing pain. Um, so um, it was sufficient that there was pain trigger, even though that pain did not persist. Uh, 
next case is another credit causation case of IFCA and Shaheen Enterprises. And uh, it's another aggravation case, a cervical spine and another pre-existing cervical spine injury. Uh, and it's probably, it is noteworthy, I think that um, the OM hearing commenced on 12 April 2013 and there was an affidavit for the plaintiff from 2011, but the, um, and it's quite common for late updated affidavits to be served prior to hearing, but this one was only three days prior on the, uh, on the 9th of April, and it really was um, uh, the, the focus of the, of the trial judge's um, judgment in dismissing uh, the application because his honour found that uh, that affidavit was a, a construct, an attempt to fix problems that should have either been attempted to be fixed uh, in the earlier affidavit or, um, or really couldn't, couldn't be fixed, in effect. Uh, the plaintiff was the only Vivovoci witness and the other issue in the case was that um, the defendant had placed her GP and husband on notice but ultimately didn't require them uh, for cross-examination. The trial judge did form uh, what he said was a particularly unfavourable impression of the, of the plaintiff as a witness. Um, there are a number of aspects of the affidavit which were um, the first affidavit that were misleading in respect of the failure to disclose the pre-existing neck condition, the receipt of compensation for that condition, uh, the ongoing treatment uh, in the years prior to the accident in relation to that condition, uh, the fact on top of that that she'd given inconsistent histories to various doctors, um, the confusing nature of her evidence and um, uh, a failure, uh, inconsistencies in her GP's own notes, histories in relation to, to her condition and the progress of her condition. So. Um, uh, the, it was a, a failed attempt to, to fix those, those problems and uh, His Honour rejected that evidence. And then an aspect of the appeal was that having done that, the, um, uh, the evidence of the doctor and the husband was effectively unchallenged and that the trial judge should still have relied on that evidence as supporting the plaintiff's case. But the trial judge placed little weight on the husband's evidence given their extremely close relationship and it was largely to the same effect as the plaintiff's discredited affidavit evidence. And although the GP had been the tutor over many years, the GP himself had made a statement that he um, deferred to specialist opinion and the, um, the trial judge did prefer the opinion of those more highly qualified specialists. Uh, and there was an Ansett and Taylor point raised um, in relation to, to payment of, um, uh, of medical treatment which was insufficient in the, in the context of, of the case. Uh, my final case is the most recent decision handed down a couple of weeks ago on the 7th of August that of Patmanas and Commonwealth Bank. And in this case, the plaintiff relied on uh, cervical spine injury under, under subparagraph A of section 134AB37 and a chronic pain syndrome under C. And uh, there's a comment in both the um, the trial judge's judgment and the, the court appeal judgment in relation to the requirement of the trial judge to, to review the reports of 20 medical practitioners in this case, which was noted to be excessive and did raise uh, an issue um, in relation to possible doctor shopping, which didn't, didn't lead to further, further comment. Uh, the, there was some surveillance shown, which wasn't um, considered to be particularly strong surveillance, but did show inconsistency in relation to 
the, um, the presentation of the plaintiff in court, uh, where she was quite rigid in relation to her neck compared to her more um, relaxed um, attitude and posture shown on, on surveillance. And then uh, she was also pacing up and down the court, and that clearly irritated uh, the, the judge, and, uh, uh, and he, um, he did form a dim view in relation to her, her presentation. Uh, he formed the view that her behaviour in court was an attempt to show the seriousness of her pain and restriction. Uh, so the case was largely put actually under A for the physical injury at the OM and was um, uh, dismissed under both heads um, because the, um, the trial judge found that um, whatever physical injury that she'd suffered had been overwhelmed by a psychologically based chronic pain syndrome and that there was an element of abnormal illness behaviour. Uh, and then in considering the psychiatric injury, it didn't meet the uh, severe test. Um, that there were, um, and the, in commenting on this, the Court of Appeals said the judge correctly noted that there were no symptoms or consequences in the present case that are ordinarily seen in psychological disorders at the more severe end of the spectrum. Specifically, there was no relevant hospitalisation, significant psychiatric treatment and medication or evidence of the more serious symptoms of su suicidal ideation or attempts or other psychotic symptoms. Uh, so application dismissed and then appealed, and the appeal then was put on the basis of the C, the C case, and that was um, pursued, that, um, that the uh, trial judge had then failed to have, um, give sufficient weight to the, to the balance of psychiatric opinion, having accepted um, that it was a C case. Um, but in, um, so there's initial difficulty in, in terms of the, the switch in, in focus, but in doing so, then um, the appellant was, was found to have failed to grapple with um, the hopelessly intertwined nature of the report sought to be relied on in pursuing the, the C case in terms of the, um, the physical and um, psychiatric consequences, and um, they couldn't really criticise the trial judge um, not having um, satisfactorily conducted that exercise themselves. So those are my cases. I think now we're having a, a short break, is that? Yeah. That's right. Uh, thanks, Paul. Excellent. Thank Now hopefully that's uh, given you something to think about. What we'll do now is break for about 10 minutes or so and have a coffee and a bit of a chat.